Hello, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about the skeletal and articular system. So, the word skeleton comes from the Greek word skeleton, meaning dried up. It is strong, yet light adapted for its function of body protection and motion. Uh, the skeletal system includes bones, joints, cartilages and ligaments. The joints give the body flexibility and allow movements to occur. But from structural point of view, the human skeletal system consists of two main types of supportive connective tissue, bone and cartilage. We chart the functions of the skeletal system. Well, first of all, the support, protection, movement and others. Well, the support, uh, it forms the internal framework that supports and anchors all soft organs. Protection, because the bones protect soft body organs. And movement, in fact, skeletal muscles attached to the skeletal system use the bone to levers to move uh, the body uh, and its parts. Other functions are storage. In fact, fat is stored in the internal cavities of bones. Bone itself serves as a, a storehouse of minerals, the most important being uh, calcium and phosphorus. Uh, another function, a really important function, is blood cell formation. In fact, it occurs within the, uh, the marrow cavities of certain bones, not every bone. The bone is a specialized connective tissue that has the strength of cast iron and the lightness of pine wood. Living bone is not dry, brittle or dead. It is a moist, cha um, moist changing productive tissue that is continually resorbed, reformed and remodeled. There are different types of bones. The long bone is called long as its length is greater than its width. Uh, the most obvious long bones are in the arm and leg. Uh, they act as levers that pulled by contraction of muscles. Short bones uh, is uh, uh, where the bones that have got equal length and width and thickness. Uh, so they are uh, shaped with regular orientation. They occur in the wrist, for example, or ankle. Then we have the flat bones that are thin or curved, more often uh, they are flat. This includes ribs, uh, scapulae and sternum and bone of cranium. Uh, we also have irregular bones, uh, they do not fit in any other category. So examples are the vertebral, uh, the facial and hip bones. Have you ever heard about the sesamoid bones? They are small bones embedded uh, within certain tendons, uh, the fibrous cord that connects muscle to bones, but we are going to talk about them later. Uh, typical sesamoid bones are patella and pisiform carpal bone, which are in the tendon of quadriceps, femoris and flexor carp ulnaris muscle respectively. Accessory bones are most commonly found in the feet. They usually occur in the developing bone and do not fuse completely. They look like extra bones or broken, uh, or broken bones on x-rays. We also have sutural or wormian bones that are examples of accessory bones. Let's take an example. Uh, let's talk about the tibia and the leg. It is one of the longest bones in the body. In the adults it has Mm, diaphys, so the tubular shaft, a uh, hollow cylindrical with walls of compact bone tissue. The long part of the long bones is called diaphysis, while uh, the short parts at the extreme, at the extreme level of the, of the bone are called epiphysis. So the medullary cavity running through the length of the diaphysis contains yellow marrow in adults and red marrow in children. The porous lattice work of the spongy epiphysis is filled with red bone marrow, even in the adults. The red marrow also known as myeloid tissue. The endosteum is mm, lining the medullary cavity of compact bone tissue and covering the trabeculae of spongy bone tissue. The periosteum uh, is covering the outer surface of the bone. It is absent at joints and replaced by articular cartilage. 
So bone tissue is composed of cells embedded in a matrix of ground substances and fibers. It is more rigid than other tissues because it contains inorganic salts, mainly calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate, a network of collagenous fibers in the matrix gives bone tissue its strength and flexibility. Most bones have an outer sheet of compact bone tissue enclosing an interior spongy bone tissue. Compact bone tissue forms the outer sheet of a bone. It is very hard and dense. It appears to naked eyes to be solid, but not. It's, it is not, actually. Compact bone tissue contains cylinders of calcified bone uh, known as osteons or aversion system. Osteons are made of concentric layers called lamellae, which are arranged seemingly in wider and wider uh, drinking straws. In the center of the osteons are central canals, aversion canals, which are longitudinal canals that contain blood vessels, nerves and lymphatic vessels. Central canals usually have branches called perforating canals or Falkmann's canals that run at right angle to central canal, extending the system of nerves and vessels outward to periosteum and to endosteum. Lacuna uh, little, which are little spaces that houses osteocytes, which are the bone cells, are contained in lamella. Radiating from each lacuna are tiny canalicoli containing the slender extensions of the osteocytes where nutrients and wastes can pass to and from central canals. The spongy bone tissue is in the form of an open interlaced pattern that withstands maximum stress and supports in shifting stress. Trabecular are tiny spikes of bone tissue surrounded by bone matrix that has calcified. The bone contains five types of cells, osteogenic cells, uh, these are small spindle-shaped cells. They found mostly in the deepest layer of periosteum and endosteum. They have high mitotic potential and can be transformed into bone-forming cells. They are called osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are found in the growing portion of bone, including periosteum, and they are able to synthesize and secrete unmineralized ground substance and act as pump cells to move calcium and phosphate in and out of bone tissue. Osteocytes are the main cells of fully developed bones. They have a cell body that occupies a lacuna. Osteocytes are derived from, derived from uh, osteoblasts. Uh, they, together with osteoclasts, play an important role of homeostasis by helping to release calcium. Osteoclasts are multinuclear giant cells which are found where bone is resorbed during its normal growth. Osteoclasts are uh, derived from white blood cells called monocytes. Uh, the bone uh, is the lining cells are found, that are found on the surface of most bones in the age of skeleton. They are believed to, be der to derive from osteoblasts that seizes their physiological activity. Bones develop through a process known as ossification. Bone in embryo develops in two ways. Intramembranous ossification if bone develops directly from mesenchymal tissue. Examples are vault of the skull, flat bones and part of the clavicle. In this type of ossification, development continues rapidly from the center. Then endochondrial ossification, when bone tissue develops by replacing hyaline cartilage. The cartilage itself do not convert it into bone, but the cartilage is replaced by bone through the process. Endochondrial ossification produces long bones and all other bones not formed by intramembranous ossification. Which are the functions of the bones? As I told you, the functions are supportive and protection of internal organs, the storehouse and main supply of reserve calcium and phosphate. Looking to the bone, uh, it reveals the surface is not smooth but scarred with bumps, holes and ridges. These are surface uh, markings where muscles, tendons and ligaments attached and blood and lymph vessels and nerves pass. Uh, we also find many depressions and openings. Uh, the fissure narrow is a cleft-like opening between adja uh, adjacent parts of the bone. Examples are sopra and orbital uh, fissure. 
Foramen is a is bigger, round opening, for example the foramen magnum. Meatus is a relatively narrow and tubular canal, example external auditory meatus. There are also many processes to which tendons, ligaments and other connective tissues attach, like tubercles, tuberosities, trochanters, uh, lines, spinous processes, epicondyles and others. How can we divide the skeletal system? Well, the uh, adult human skeletons have 206 named bones that are grouped into two principal parts. These are the axial and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton consists on bones that lie around the axis and the appendicular skeleton consists of bones of the body out of the axial group. These are appendages. Upper and lower extremities belong to the appendicular skeleton. The number of skull bones is sometimes listed as 22 when the uh, ossicles of the ears, there are six bones, and the single hyoid bone is counted separately. Technically, the hyoid bone is not part of the skull. The thoracic vertebrae are sometimes included in the category. Technically, the term arm refers to the upper extremity between the shoulder and elbow. The forearm is between the elbow and wrist, so be careful with the terminology. The upper part of the lower extremity between the pelvis and knee is the thigh. The leg is between the knees and the ankles. So let's first talk about the axial skeleton, the skull. The skull rests on the superior and vertebral vertebra. The skull rests on the superior and vertebral column and it is composed of cranial and facial bones. We've got the ethmoid bone, uh, the frontal bone, the occipital bone, parietal, sphenoid and temporal bones. Uh, the, the skeleton of the cranium is really complicated, so it would be necessary to speak about it very, uh, very long. So in, in this course I'm just going to tell you which are the general features of each, um, of each system. And then of course if you are interested in uh, Looking more into these subjects, I suggest you uh, studying on the anatomy books or just uh, watching on uh, documentaries that you can easily find on uh, the web, fortunately. The skull bones are articulated uh, with some uh, immovable joints, which are called sutures. Uh, we've got the coronal suture between the frontal and the two parietal bones, sagittal suture between the two parietal bones, lambdoidal suture between parietal and occipital bone, squamosal suture between parietal bone and temporal bone. The facial bones are inferior nasal bones, conchi bones, lacrimal bones, mandible bone, maxillae bone, palatine bone, vomer bone, uh, zygomatic bone, hyoid bone and the ossicle of the ear. Uh, the orbits um, are two. Uh, the orbit is a pyramid shaped space that contains the eyeball and associated structures. It is formed by bones of the skull. Orbit has four walls and an apex. The roof of the orbit consists of parts of the frontal and sphenoid bone, the lateral wall is formed by portion of zygomatic and sphenoid bone, the floor of the orbit is formed by parts of the maxilla, zygomatic and palatine bone, the medial wall is formed by portion of the maxilla, lacrimal and ethmoid and sphenoid bone. In the orbit there are openings that pass structures. Some of the principal openings and the structure passing through are optic foramen canal where passes optic nerve, superior orbital fissure where uh, passes supraorbit nerve and artery, inferior orbital fissure where passes maxillary branch of trigeminal and zygomatic nerve and infraorbital vessels, supraorbital foramen uh, where passes oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic branch of trigeminal and abducent nerves. Canal for nasolacrimal duct passes nasolacrimal uh, duct. And finally the canal for nasolacrimal duct. Let's move on to the vertebral column. The vertebral column together with the sternum and ribs constitutes the skeleton of the trunk of the body. It composes two-fifths of the height 
of the body and has average length in male of 71 centimeters and in female 61. The adult vertebral column contains 26 vertebras. Prior to fusion of sacral and costesial vertebra, the total number is 33. It is a strong and flexible to either direction and rotated on itself. It encloses and protects spinal cord, supports the head and serves as a point of attachment for the ribs and muscles of the back. Between the adjacent vertebra from the first to sacrum, there are um, intervertebral discs. They are fibrocartilaginous. Each disc is composed of the outer fibrous ring consisting fibrocartilage called annulus fibrosis and the inner soft pulpy highly elastic structure called the nucleus pulpus. The disc permits various movement of uh, the vertebral column. Uh, it so absorbs shock and form uh, a strong joint. The vertebral column when viewed from side is not a straight line, rather have bandings. These are normal curves of the vertebral column. There are four normal curves formed by vertebras. Two are concave and the other two are convex. The presences of the, cure of the curve have several functions. The presences, the presences of the curve have several functions. These are absorption of shock, maintenance of balance, protection of column from fracture and increasing the strength of the column. In the age of the fetus, this is only a single anterior concave curve, but approximately the third postnatal month, uh, when the child begins to hold head erect, the cervical curve develops. Later, when the child sits up, stands and walks, the lumbar curve develops. Uh, the cervical and lumbar curves are an anteriorly convex and because of the mo modification of the fetal position they are called secondary curves. The thoracic and sacral curves are anteriorly concave. Uh, since they retain the anterior concavity of the fetal curve they are referred uh, to be primary curves. Although there are variations in size and shape, the vertebras of the different regions have basically similar structures. It consists of um, the body, vertebral, arch and seven processes. So the body is thick, disc-shaped anterior part. It has superior and inferior uh, roughened area for attachment with intervertebral discs. The vertebral, also called neural arch, extends posterior from the body of the vertebra. Uh, with the body it surrounds the spinal cord. Uh, it is formed by two short thick processes called pedicles. It projects posteriorly to meet at lamina. The lamina are flat parts that join to form the posterior portion of the vertebral arch and the space that lies between the vertebral arch and body contains the spinal cord called a vertebral foramina. The vertebral foramina of all vertebrae together form the vertebral or spinal canal and the pedicles are notched superiorly and inferiorly to form an opening between vertebrae on each side of the column called intervertebral foramen. Intervertebral foramen is an opening between the vertebras that serves as passage of nerves that come out of spinal cord to supply the various body parts. There are a lot of different processes that emerge from the vertebras. The transverse processes on both sides extend laterally. The spinous processes extend uh, posteriorly and inferiorly from the junction of the lamina. Both the transverse and spinous processes are muscle attachments, um, so um, they are very important. And the remaining four processes form joints with other vertebra. Two of them articulate with the immediate superior vertebra and the other two articulate with the immediate inferior vertebra. We've got seven cervical vertebrae. The first is called atlas, the second axis and, seven, and uh, the others are called C3, C4, 5, 6 and 7. Uh, third, the third uh, to the sixth are typical. They all contain transverse foramina. Atlas supports the head and permits yes motion of head like this, a joint between skull and atlas. Axis permit, permits the no motion, so this motion, at joint between axis and atlas. We've got 12 thoracic vertebrae. Uh, the bodies and transverse processes have facets that articulate T1, 
to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve with ribs. Lamina are short, thick, and broad. They, they articulate with ribs. The lumbar vertebra are five. They are the largest one, the strongest ones. They are adapted for attachment of back muscles. The sacrum is a wedge shaped made up of five fused bodies uh, united by four intervertebral discs. It's, um, it supports vertebral column and gives strength and stability to pelvis. The coccyx is a triangular tailbone united with sacrum by intervertebral disc. Uh, so it is made of three to five fused bones. It's a vestige of an embryonic tail. In a child there are 33 separate vertebrae because the vertebrae belonging to the sacrum and the coccyx are not fused yet. The thorax refers to the chest. Uh, it is a bony cage formed by sternum, uh, which is the breastbone, costal cartilage, ribs and bodies of the thoracic uh, vertebrae, as I told you. The sternum is flat, narrow bone measuring about 15 centimeters, uh, so 6 inches, located in the median line of anterior thoracic wall. It consists on three basic portions, the manibrium, so, which is the superior portion, the body, which is the middle and largest portion, and the xiphoid process, which is inferior and smallest, the smallest portion. The junction of the manibrium and the body forms the sternal angle. The manibrium on its superior portion has a depression called jugular soprasternal notch. On each side of the jugular notch are clavicular notch that articulates with medial end of clavicle. The manibrium also articulates with the first and second rib. Uh, the body of the sternum articulates directly or indirectly with the second to the uh, tenth rib. The xiphoid process consists um, of a hyaline cartilage uh, during infancy and childhood and do not ossify completely up to the age of 40. The human being contains 12 pairs of ribs that make up the side of thoracic cavity. Ribs increase in length from the first through uh, till uh, the seventh. And each rib posteriorly articulates with the body of its corresponding thoracic vertebra. Anteriorly, the first seven ribs have direct attachment to sternum by coastal cartilages. Hence, they are called true uh, vertebral sternal ribs. Uh, the remaining five ribs are called false ribs. Uh, so the uh, eighth uh, till the tenth ribs, uh, they are groups of, um, they are called false ribs and also they are also called vertebral chondrial ribs because their cartilage attaches one another and then attaches to the cartilage of the seventh rib. The eleventh and the twelfth ribs are designated as floating ribs because their anterior part even doesn't attach in indirectly to sternum, so they are totally free. Although there are many variations, when we examine a typical rib, we can say that it contains a head, neck and body part. The head is a projection of posterior end of the rib and it consists on one or two faces that articulate with faces of the vertebra, corresponding vertebra. The body is the main part of the rib. The costal angle is the side where the rib changes its direction. The inner side of the costal angle is costal growth where thoracic nerves and blood vessels are uh, protected. The inner side of the costal angle is costal growth, where thoracic nerves and blood vessels are protected. So let's uh, move on to the appendicular skeleton. Uh, and first of all, let's talk about the upper extremities, so the limbs. The upper extremities consist on 64 bones that are connected and supported by the axial skeleton with only shoulder joint and many muscle from a complex of suspension bands. We've got the clavicle, which is a collar bone, double curved, which is a long bone with rounded medial end and flattened lateral end. It is held in place by ligaments. Then we've got the scapula, which is uh, flat triangular bone with horizontal spine separating fossa, two different fossa. It is the site of attachment for muscles of arm and chest. In the arm we've got the homerus, which is the longest, the largest bone of upper limb. 
and it is the site of attachment for muscles of shoulder and arm, permitting arm to flex and extend at elbow. We've got uh, in the forearm, we've got the radius, which, which is the largest of the two bones in forearm. Uh, it is, um, its end, its proximal end consists of an olecranon process and it forms uh, the, the elbow joint. The wrist is made of 16 carpals, uh, which are small, short bones. And then we've got the hands and the fingers. Uh, here we find the metacarpals, so five miniature long bones in each hand uh, that articulate with fingers at metacarpophalangeal joint. Uh, this, these bones are important for the opposi opposition movement of thumb and they enable cupping of hands. The phalanges are miniature long bones uh, in each thumb we've got two, three in each uh, fingers, in each finger, except the thumb. They articulate with each other at interphalangeal joints and they allow fingers to participate in stable grips. Let's talk about the lower limbs. Well, we have the uh, pelvic girdle. In the pelvic girdle we find the hip bone, which is an irregular bone formed by fusion of ilium, ischium and pubis. Uh, in the lower limbs we find also, in, in particular in the thigh, the femur, which is the um, typical long bone, the longest one, the strongest one and the heaviest one. It provides articular surface for the knee and it supports the body, so it's very important. Then we've got the patella, which is a sesamoid bone within quadriceps femoris tendon. It increases uh, leverage for quadriceps uh, muscle by keeping tendon away from axis of rotation. In the leg we find the fibula and the tibia. The fibula is smaller than the tibia, it's a long bone. Uh, it articulates proximally with tibia and distally with talus. It bears little body weight but gives strength to ankle joint. The tibia is longer than the fibula, it's a long bone of the lower leg and it articulates with femur, femur fibula uh, and the talus also. It supports body weight, transmitting it uh, from uh, femur to talus. In the ankle we find the tarsals. The foot and the toes are made of metatarsals, miniature long bones, five in each foot. From, they um, form arches and improve they improve stability while standing and absorb uh, sh the shocks and the beer weight and they also add in locomotion of course. The phalanges are miniature long bones, two in each big toe, three in each other toe. They are arranged as in, hand, in the hand so they provide stability during locomotion. The sole of your foot is arched for the same reason that your spine is curved. Beside its function of absorbing shock, uh, the shocks, it prevents nerves and blood vessels in the sole of the foot from being crushed, so it's a very important thing. There are three arches in the foot, two longitudinal, medial and lateral and one transverse. Bones, being structural framework, muscles give it power, but movable joints provide the mechanism that allows the body to move. The articulations or joints are placed where two adjacent bones uh, or cartilages meet. The classification is this one. Joints are classified by two methods, by function degree of movement, by structure presence of cavity. According to the functional classification, joints may be immovable, so synarthrosis, slightly movable, so amphiarthrosis, and freely movable, called diarthrosis. According to functional classification, joints may be immovable, so they are also called synarthrosis, slightly movable or amphiarthrosis, and freely movable, also called diarthrosis. According to structure, a joints can be classified into fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial joints. So this is it for this lesson, I'll see you next time, bye!